There's lots of uh, predictions in the TV show Black Mirror about what the future might look like. Augmented uh, memories and social networks that run a society and uh, weird 80s revival. Anyway, today I want to talk about one prediction in Black Mirror that I think is about to come true. Many episodes are set in these beautiful mansions seemingly out in the middle of nowhere. And I always assumed watching it that this was the consequence of self-driving cars or something. You know, you can like sit back in your car, commute to the city watching TV, hit the turps at night, and then uh, afterwards your car will drive you home. You are intoxicated. Enable the autopilot so you don't kill your third pedestrian. Who's he talking to? Nobody, this boy's a hardcore alky. But now I'm realizing this world is coming much sooner for a much more mundane reason. Introducing remote work. No commute required. For a manager, an office is pretty convenient. The most basic metric of an employee doing their job is they're sitting in their seat at this time of day with work on their screen. You know, if that's happening, something is probably being produced. Offices make this sort of bums in the seat, screens on task management much easier. But I think we've known for a while that it favors the manager over the employee, <laughs> and possibly more importantly, it favors the manager over actual productivity. During COVID, one third of Canadians started working from home, and only 36% said that they are likely to go back to their places of work after the pandemic. Now that businesses have been forced to adapt or fail, they're often realizing that remote work works really well. It's kind of like an iPod. All the components were there for years, just waiting for a catalyst. Except instead of a narcissistic uh, perfectionist, we got a nasty pandemic. Do you see now? Yeah, I see. Oh, God. Setting goals for staff. Do you see? Yeah. Tracking if these goals were achieved. Do you see? Yes. No one likes signing birthday cards. Oh, my see? God. Now, Dropbox is going to the permanently work from home thing. Uh, Twitter, so has uh, Square. In Canada, big players like Shopify and Rogers are also moving to work from home. Even small companies like the guy I bought my chair from the other day. It's like, why are you selling all these chairs, man? And he told me, I was like, that's really interesting. <laughs> Hit it home with my chair and lots of ideas for videos. Why is this happening? Well, first of all, employees want it. Cisco got 87% of staff wanting to choose where they worked from. Even a company that I used to work for landed around that kind of 9 out of 10 number. For some employees, they'd like, you know, one or two days a week where they come into the office, you know, so you have your like meetings and schedule some client stuff, pick up mail or use the printer or some equipment, you know, and then the rest of the days they work from home. And for others, like the call center jobs, you know, 100% of the time working from home is no problem at all. But the biggest factor and why I'm pretty sure this will be a wait a minute, you know, from some groups in the next few years. Well, companies save a bucket load of cash by no longer leasing as much office space. 250 major tech tenants recently surveyed found that 55% of them plan to downsize. But it doesn't have to be tech. I mean, a good example of that is what's going on uh, with the Rogers call center in Ottawa. They decided not to renew their lease and pilot permanent remote work for their 375 staff. And they got 87% again, weirdly enough, of staff saying that they wanted to work from home 100% of the time. Commercial leases are quite long, like five, 10 years. So they are gonna come due for companies um, and give different windows to exit. Rogers has around 7,000 call center staff. And I would guess the one in Ottawa was just the first call center lease that was due. So what is the issue with people working from home? As companies make work from home official, it becomes work from anywhere, not just home. And so I think a lot of people are gonna be moving into those black mirror digs. I mean, who doesn't wanna live in falling water, right? Why? Well, for a remote worker, the only important thing is the internet connection. I was really surprised how often when I was searching around that I found really good internet in suburbs and small towns. There are also lots of little companies um, like Community Fiber, for example, in Ontario, and they will run a line to a neighborhood if you can get enough neighbors on board. These fiber networks are actually spreading pretty quickly into places that seemed crazy a few years ago. And with hundreds of thousands of remote workers suddenly looking around for property based on their internet connections out in these more like rural areas, it's gonna create a lot of demand and a lot of opportunities for telecoms providers. 
And then if you're talking about a super remote location or somewhere that's nowhere near an existing high-speed internet connection, I also noticed that Starlink got approved for transmission in Canada uh, the other day, which will be an interesting thing to keep your eye on. So now you can pretty much just shop by internet connection by plugging in the address on your listing to the uh, telco provider. Realtors have certainly noticed and many remote properties are now being listed with high-speed internet as a benefit. Check out this place near Granby for 260,000 for a three bedroom with exactly the same fiber package that I have in Montreal. You would never get a house in this condition with this amount of land anywhere near where I live. And here's another option if you wanted to build your own place. Most places outside cities are cheaper and easier to build in. There's less regulations and less neighbors to have to get approval from. So here's this five acre lot to build your house on. Nice lake, fast internet, and only $129,000. Both of these places are about like an hour and a half commute from downtown. In many places in North America, people already make that sort of a commute every day. Even more will when they only have to make it once or twice a week in exchange for like a 75% discount on a house. And speaking of transport, when you want to go to town, you're going to be enjoying these record low oil prices and an even cheaper, ever increasing range of great electric vehicles. Yay, I'm an environmentalist. I mean, I'm joking because right now this lifestyle would be terrible for the environment. A lot of that is caused by transport emissions. But there's a future coming very soon where this sort of lifestyle doesn't have the impact that it used to. You know, solar panels on the roof, electric delivery vehicles, and an electric car for the few days where you do commute or go and run errands. Of course, many cities have also been building transit lines that enable people to use park and ride car parks. The two properties are actually only an hour away from the terminus station for the new REM in Montreal, where parking will be cheap and easy. Another advantage for completely remote work is income taxes. Certain states like Texas have no income tax. Even in Canada between the provinces, there's a large variation in the sorts of taxes that you'd pay. I mean, Quebec is not very competitive and Ontario is really not that far. Thinking beyond that, some countries have incredibly low cost of living, not just property, and they also have low taxes. But before you're getting stoked about paying off your mortgage in two years and going to live in Fiji, you gotta think through what this actually means. If your employer allows you to live anywhere and do your job, then your employer can also hire from anywhere. It's kind of a second step. The labor market for white collar jobs is about to become very globalized. White collar workers will face the same levels of competition that destroyed manufacturing jobs. Your inherent proximity advantage dissolves when you are just another window in a Zoom meeting. Ah, it's probably gonna be fine. Or is it? Is this happening though? So there's absolutely no doubt that remote work is occurring more. I think we can all agree on that. But are the fairly obvious economic drivers leading to an exodus from downtown? And if it is, what are the consequences? Anecdotally, which is the worst sort of evidence, but you know, it illustrates a point. I heard about some people moving to cabin country and deciding to change their children's school district for the year. And that struck me because human parents love their children. Um, and probably don't want to have to make them move school districts and stuff. Um, but also, uh, if their employer said to them, well, you have to come back, you know, sorry, we're, you know, COVID's over and back in the office, they could easily just say, well, I quit. Because now there are so many employers who would say, no problem. Anyone who wants to work remotely can probably find a job working remotely. You don't have to wait for your employer to figure it out if you really want that rural or suburban lifestyle. As far as hard evidence goes, because you know the census and school enrollments and all this stuff are just all up in the air um, and unreliable at the moment, I think the first indicator for us would be an oversupply of condos in city centers. This would happen because condos are basically the opposite of a product that a remote worker would want, because their selling point is often being close to the workplace but their downside is that they're not very spacious. And space is something that we want if we're working from home. Space is a necessary thing. These are the voyages of hating your spouse. You can indeed see a clear trend across the continent's rental markets and Canadian cities with an unusually high number of condos on the market. In Montreal right now, for example, there are currently 1,330 more units on the market than there were last year. This hasn't really been explained by increased supply because thanks to COVID we have also completed less builds this year than last year at this time. This is actually very concerning because you know despite all this 
month to month, you see a 10% increase in price on the previous year. Like, and there's another consequence that you'd expect to see, which is concerning, um, and that's vacant office space downtown, which should also impact condo prices, because most of downtown, in Montreal at least, is mixed zoned, which means as buildings empty out of their commercial tenants, um, we'll probably start to see a conversion over to residential, you know, if there's demand for that. In fact, to save downtown and ensure a consumer base for whatever businesses are left after this, we're going to need to rapidly convert all of this stuff over to residential. People seem to have forgotten that there is no rule that says property values have to keep going up forever. With all these changes going on, immigration now uh, the lowest that it's been in over 20 years, and the shape of our population pyramid, I'm hesitant to say this because people always pay the price for betting against the property market, and you know even crashes always recover if the fundamentals are there. But it's the fundamentals that are what are concerning to me. You know, back in 2008, our large cities were still highly desirable places, you know, even if the economy sucked. But the fundamentals might change this time because we're basically about to find out who actually wants to live here. I'm always surprised how many people I meet that don't actually love living in the city. A lot of people seem to have a desire to live next to nature and do some bird watching or have a backyard or whatever. And they don't like neighbors or noise and going out to restaurants and live shows and the benefits that you actually get from living in a the city. They're reluctantly here. And then at the same time, I mean, for me, I like people watching, you know, sitting in the park. Although I guess I'll do some bird watching sometimes, but only for uh, peacocks. He's so cultured. The question really is, what do millennials want? What do they want? So far, they've been really into city life and it's driven a huge revitalization of city centers. What we're about to find out is how many of them were just there to avoid commuting. And if it's not many, well, when demand is high and unmet, you get gentrification. If demand is low and oversupplied, you get blight. And oh man, you know, people complain about gentrification forcing people out of neighborhoods. It's like a neighborhood loses its heart with gentrification. Oh, but with blight, it loses its life. We already have lots of retail in the state already, and we could potentially be adding millions of square feet of commercial to that. If residential demand doesn't pick up the slack, we're quite fucked. If you end up with a smaller tax base and no commuters, you know, public transit budgets won't work. These restaurants and shops that relied on, you know, office workers can close. I mean, things can get quite depressing. But on the positive side, because I'm a positive guy, here is a different vision of the future. And of course, the future is likely to be some mix of these two. There's a future for our society that is happier because people are getting to choose what they actually want, you know, not what their employer wants. People who want to live in the city live there because they want that lifestyle. And we finally get some relief from these endless property and rent hikes. Vacant commercial gets quickly converted across to residential, which maintains the tax base, which means that those restaurants can still be lively and still work. Their customer base has changed over from office workers to thousands of new residents living above them. And in the past, this urbanist nightmare of a huge number of people moving to the suburbs and you know, commuting in each day meant massive congestion in the city. But with remote work and delivery, we don't need to use the streets as much as we used to for cars. So it's going to be a lot easier for cities to become even more pedestrian oriented and quieter and greener and more pleasant for the people that are left in town. In fact, some of those people who right now are looking at moving out of town Maybe, you know, look back at the more reasonable prices and quieter streets and the equation starts to shift so that staying in the city makes more sense for them. Do you want me to say it? Here it goes. Time will tell. The laziest <laughs> finishing line. Many episodes are said in these kind of beautiful flank... Many episodes are said in these kind of beautiful, like, flank... Flank? Many episodes are said in these beautiful, modernist, like, flank. Flank? God, why can't I say frank? Many episodes are said in these beautiful, uh, like, flank. Fucking hell. Many episodes are said in these beautiful and remote, like, uh, flank. Fuck you, Paige. Frank. Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright. So I think a lot of people are going to be moving into those Black Mirror dicks. I mean, who doesn't want to live in a flank? Flank? <laughs> I can't.